Welcome, everyone. Um, I will introduce the speaker uh, in just a moment. So my name is Matt Baker, and I'm Associate Dean for Faculty Development in the Georgia Tech College of Sciences. And uh, we are co-sponsoring this event uh, with the College of Engineering, and, and Shannon Yi is here from the College of Engineering. Shannon will be moderating the questions at the end. Uh, so if you would, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A during the talk, and we will uh, answer them uh, at the end. Poe will, will answer them at the end, and Shannon will moderate. And you feel, feel free to like uh, questions, uh, et cetera, uh, as the talk is going on. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, our speaker for you. So we're very happy to have Po Shen Lo. He is uh, a math professor at Carnegie Mellon, um, and he has a distinguished publish, publication record in the general area of combinatorics. Uh, but he's also very um, versatile and does a number of other things. For example, he is the national coach of the USA International Math Olympiad team, uh, which has had remarkable and historic success in recent years under um, Poe's direction. He also founded a uh, math and science education platform called xb.com, uh, and he is prolific in creating YouTube uh, videos which teach concepts about mathematics and, and science to uh, millions of viewers. And Poe will tell you the story, I believe, during his talk of how he got into working on the Novid app, which we'll be hearing about, but it's a very interesting story, in fact, in, in how he uh, got into this. So I think you'll appreciate that personal part of the lecture as well as the very interesting science here. And so without further ado, uh, Po Shen Lo. Wow, well, thank you very much. It's actually a real pleasure and honor to be able to talk to all of you. Uh, actually, for me, Georgia Tech is a very special place because you guys are very good at the area of math that I work on, which is combinatorics. In fact, I've been to Georgia Tech on several occasions to research, uh, to work on research collaborations with faculty or to give talks. And now, that's actually what my life used to focus on. I used to, I used to focus on thinking about graph theory, combinatorics, and interesting ways that you could try to prove results about if you just happen to have a random network, uh, what do you know about random networks? That's not what we're talking about tonight. Actually, tonight we're talking about something which is very, very far afield from that. And just to make a very brief comment about what, the, what was mentioned in the introduction about, um, about the, the, the way that I ended up landing on this area. Actually, the story there is because I actually am a Hertz Foundation fellow. And the Hertz Foundation you may or may not have heard of, but what they do is they try to find about 15 people every year across all disciplines in the United States who are about to start their PhDs. And after a series of interviews, uh, they, they choose a few people to award uh, fellowships for, for, uh, for a free PhD study, uh, covering the PhD study. But uh, there's a moral commitment that comes in exchange with this, which is that if there's ever a moment of national emergency, you'll come to help. And so I actually uh, am one of these people. And when COVID struck, uh, there were many of us which, who, who, were, who were rallied to the cause of trying to see if there's anything we could possibly do. And I'll say, I'm a mathematician. At the beginning, when I saw this call, I, I didn't know whether I could contribute anything. In fact, I wasn't sure I could. But I was looking left and right and seeing all of these other incredible Hertz fellows who were doing interesting things, from finding more efficient ways to make ventilators uh, to, to finding ways to actually go and combat, combat the disease. But then, shortly thereafter, it occurred to me that there was actually something that could be quite interesting. And that something was, we suddenly have the capability to anonymously collect a network of which people, but we don't care who the people are, which people are interacting with us, which other people, because of the fact that there are so many smartphones now which are all over the place. And obviously there are companies which use this to go and sell your personal data, but as a mathematician, the network is a network, and we always think about networks, and you don't need to use networks to sell personal data. There are other things you can use networks for. For example, you could possibly try to understand what in the world is going on with this new disease. So that's actually what I set out to do. And starting in March of last year, it's hard to believe it's almost been an entire year, but starting in March of last year, I brought a team together to go and try to figure out how to 
use smartphones to fight pandemics. And that's the general topic I'm going to be talking about here. In fact, the, the, I want to also couch this talk in the idea that I am a mathematician, so I am going to talk about theory here. We do have some early information that we have seen from actual deployments. I'll make a little comment about that later as we go. But I want to actually talk about how if one is trying to use smartphones to fight pandemics, well, this is an entirely new area. And if you were going to go and say, we'll do it the way that we've always done it, the answer is you've never done it before. And so you have to start somewhere and you start with the theory. And after working on this for many months, we actually accidentally discovered a completely new way that you could use smartphones to fight disease. And that way is a paradigm shift. It's a very different thing than what people had been doing before. I'm going to now attempt to share my screen. I don't use blue jeans uh, with my own teaching, but I'm just going to try to use this. Could I quick do a double check just to see whether or not, do people see personal yes. pandemic radar? Great. Thank you very much for the audio confirmation. I really appreciate it. Okay. So after thinking about this for a while, a long while, we realized that actually if you used smartphones in a different way, making a radar, you might unlock a totally different way of trying to fight disease. Let me explain a little bit more about what I mean. So this concept is a different paradigm, and it's based on trying to incite natural behavior modification, where the key word is natural. If I want to put this in contrast, the most natural, the, most, the best thing to do is to first comment about what had been done before. And you may or may not have heard, well, you probably had heard, there have been all of these contact tracing apps. In fact, Apple and Google even partnered in a, hist in a historic collaboration to make it possible for people to have contact tracing apps. But contact tracing apps were apps to do contact tracing, and contact tracing itself is something that has been done for centuries, actually quite, quite a bit longer than that. But I can summarize all of those approaches in a very simple game theoretic uh, construct, which is they were all based on find the person who's sick, find who they were around, and then attempt to remove all those people from society against their will. And the against their will part is actually the, the, the tricky piece. Because unfortunately, if things are against the natural incentives of people, then, well, you have the premise of every zombie movie, which, is, which consists of people using their intelligence to try to find some way to get out of it. Uh, unfortunately, we learned as we were talking to some cities, for example, that there were people who didn't participate in contact tracing because they couldn't afford to know if they should quarantine and these kinds of things. So I'm, I'm outlining that there is a, there's a problem that would be nice to solve, and that problem is called incentive alignment. And why this is an important problem to solve is because if you're dealing with a pandemic, whether it be COVID or a future pandemic, if there could be some way to align selfish incentives so that you get a good positive outcome, then you have, uh, you have just recruited 8 billion people to go and help solve the problem. And so the, 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 shift, the shift is actually quite simple. For every person who's sick, we don't actually just ask the people that were directly around them to quarantine. Actually, for every person that's sick, we tell everybody how far away that sick person is from them. Where the distance, the essential twist, is that the distance is not measured in terms of meters or feet or miles, because you can't. The reason you can't is because if there was somebody there, actually, they probably don't even know that they are sick. The, the, one of the biggest challenges is uh, these asymptomatic and presymptomatic transmission. And so, and actually also, they shouldn't be there. They should be somewhere else if they actually knew they were sick. So the problem is you don't actually have a way of, of already knowing that that person is sick. Of course, I mean, that's the, that's the value of testing, I should say. So of course, if you're doing testing, you will definitely be able to be getting this information. That's true. But you won't necessarily have this, this information at the exact same time that somebody is interacting with that person in society, because sort of if that person had a positive test, they shouldn't be in society anyway. But what I'm getting at is that the way that you want to measure how far away something is, you can think of a different metric. And metric is how we often say these things in math. We're moving from the metric of measuring with a physical distance into measuring in a network distance. And the idea is, how, how is that person getting sick anyway? Well, could have been that the person got sick because their housemate had a coworker, office mate, and that office mate got sick. If that is the case, and it is true that you are around somebody whose, uh, whose housemate's office mate got sick, then actually that disease is three relationships away from you. This is 
graph theory or network theory, the, the sort of thing that I work on, which is that there is actually an underlying social network, social graph, which consists of a node is a, is a person, and if two people spend a significant amount of time near each other, then there's a connection between them. And then you can measure how far away an infection is by measuring how many steps away on the network it is. And this is a different way of trying to think about how you control disease, which is actually why it's interesting. And then what you can do with that is you can create some charts, which actually when we made them back in June, we just thought they were cute. We didn't actually know what this was good for. What we did is we said, look, uh, if we happen to have this giant network of the various people who are using this system, we're not keeping track of who is who. We don't have any names. Uh, but we do know that there are all of these uh, connections in this network and at various distances from each person, there might be some kinds of positive cases, positive signals from people who happen to have you know, tested positive. And then, and then what we did is we said, well, you, you can plot this on a, on a chart. So the way to read these charts is that the height of a bar is how many cases there are. There are two colors in this bar. I'll explain what the difference is momentarily. But for now, let's pretend that you think of the, just think of the dark reds as actual positive cases. And so this would measure how many cases there are and it would plot it with a, against the degree of separation, which is how many steps along the network that person is from you. And so when we made this thing, we just thought it would be uh, cute information that could be useful. As we were thinking about this longer and longer though, we then realized that we had accidentally stumbled upon something which potentially could be extremely powerful. What you're looking at right now is actually the first tool of its kind where you can see whether or not disease is striking somewhere relative to you where that distance is measured in relationships with enough lead time to do something about it. Actually, this is another way to avoid disease. And that's what's interesting here, because this particular approach of avoiding disease called empowering a person to see whether or not disease is striking and coming from far away towards them in advance actually does something very interesting to the incentives. First of all, though, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what, what could you do? Why is, this why is this information useful? Well, actually, I can tell a few stories because we have had this app used in various places. And at one of the universities, uh, I actually was contacted by a student who told me that they found out from COVID. Actually, this was a thank you message. The student said thank you because the app that they had told them that there was a case two relationships away from them. That means that they spend time with someone, that person spends time with someone else, and the other person got COVID. And then they said that they were actually planning to hang out with a friend on the weekend. And then the friend checked their radar, their Novid radar, and found out that that person had COVID only one relationship away. And then uh, this person who had written to me said that was useful because then they just decided not to hang out in person. I mean, actually, if you think about it, it's very hard to have lunch with a mask on. And so the, the notion here is that if you actually have this kind of information, this actually lets you have a preemptive way of making minor changes to your life. It's not as intense as quarantining, but it actually could help you defend yourself. And the key thing here is this is engaging self-defense. And there are a few things that you could do. Actually, I'll give another example for the first one of wear a better mask. I'm also a professor. And so there was a certain time during which my university was telling me uh, I'll be going in person to teach classes. And, I, and, and I, it ended up not being that way because my class ended up getting too big and too many people came in. And so we went beyond the threshold for in person for that particular class. But during the period when people were enrolling, I was actually encouraging the students to uh, please, please download this app. It was not because I was trying to promote the app just for the sake of promoting it. No, it was for selfish reasons. I was going to go into a classroom full of uh, 20 year old students. And I wanted to know whether or not my, clo my cloth mask would need to be replaced by a surgical with a cloth or an N95. And I was actually planning to use this tool as an explicit way for me to be able to go into a classroom safely and, and operate. And of course, I mean, I should say, if you don't have this tool, there are of course many things that you can do. I don't mean to say that this is like, um, uh, like like the best thing since, since, sliced, since sliced bread, but I'm simply explaining that there are various things that a reasonable person would do. But when I realized that, I also then realized, since I hadn't been in the mindset of promoting the app, I was in the mindset of defending myself, I realized that actually probably there are a lot of educators and teachers all around the country and the world as we're thinking about reopening schools for which this actually could potentially be a useful tool. 
And the other things that I gave here in this example are also things that you could do if you saw something at distance three. But there's a key word that's important on this slide, which is about the user incentive. Because what's different between this and what was done before is that the user actually has an incentive to do something here that, that actually helps to protect themselves. This is selfish. It helps them avoid infection. Actually, if you use this properly, you could even use this to avoid quarantine in the sense that if you found out that there were cases that were more, more in your direct circles, then that might suggest that if you keep more distance from people, that would be a good idea. Because otherwise, if people do end up uh, testing positive and you've spent time with them, then you actually will also get quarantined. And the important thing here is we actually flipped all the incentives. And with that, I'm going to go into the next piece, which is the game theory. So again, as you see, I'm using the word theory. I want to emphasize that so far we've only been talking theory. But there is something here which is a very powerful theoretical game. And that is, if you compare what was done before and what we are doing now, there's a fundamental difference. The fundamental difference is that this particular approach can be used to reduce your own chance of getting infected. On the other hand, if you think about all of these other systems that people were trying to use, which were somehow unpopular, we've distilled down to what, the, what one of the core problems was, which was it actually doesn't do anything to your own chance of getting infected. It actually reduces other people's chances of getting infected. And what it will do is it will, the other systems, they will just tell you, you have already been around somebody else. And therefore, if you have already been around somebody else, now you might already be sick. So now please go and quarantine yourself to protect other people from you. I brought up this notion of a Nash equilibrium here. That's a technical term which presumably many of you are familiar with, but just because there might be a diverse audience watching this talk, let me just say what a Nash equilibrium roughly, roughly means is it's a situation where everybody's behavior is optimal for themselves from a selfish perspective, in the sense that when I say optimal, what I mean is it's a system of behaviors where everyone is doing various things and nobody has a self-interest in changing their own behavior. But let's dig into this carefully. For example, let's think about what was done before with all of these other apps that people were trying to make. Remember, installing those other apps doesn't decrease your own chance of getting sick because it tells you after you've already gotten exposed. So actually, there's only one Nash equilibrium for all of the other apps in the world, which is called nobody installs it. Because if you think about it, imagine you had some other situation. Imagine that everybody except you had a standard app installed. Well then that would, what incentive do you have to install it? If you install it, it means that you might get to quarantine also. Uh, if you don't install it, well, no one knows anyway. These are all anonymous. And if you don't install it, everyone's protecting you against them. So actually, with all of these other apps that people were trying to roll out, the situation from a, from a game theoretic perspective was that everyone who's joining it is actually being altruistic. And that's actually one reason why, if you think about the adoption curves, at the beginning, there are all these early adopters and altruistic people, and then at some point, it gets a little tough. Our approach actually flips the incentives, because by letting you see the disease come from farther away, it's actually before you're exposed. So in fact, this system has two Nash equilibria. One equilibrium point is nobody installs it, because if nobody installs it, you'd have no incentive to install it either. On the other hand, the other equilibrium is where everyone installs it. Because if everyone, imagine everyone except you had it installed. Well, what incentive do you have to install it? It's never going to ask you to quarantine. And if you install it, you suddenly get to plug into this network that everyone else is part of, and you get to find information that can help keep you safe. Actually, if you think about it, the more other people have this type of radar system installed, actually, the more you want to install it which is a very interesting reversal of the sign of, of the incentive. And so actually the way that ours is, is that there are two different Nash equilibria. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on as I, as I explain what actually happened in some of the places that we deployed. Now, all of this so far is talking about how, you know, it looks like there is something going on here where you might be able to flip the incentives. But why would we bother? I mean, is this, is this going to potentially give you anything, any advantage? Well, actually, it turns out that if, I, if we were to think about how theoretically this compares against all of the other approaches that have been tried with apps before, there are actually several order of magnitude improvements that I want to hit on. And that's actually why this is exciting. 
So the first one is that actually all of the other category of apps that ask you to quarantine after you've already been exposed have a very, very fundamental issue. And this fundamental issue actually was not widely known, uh, apparently, even to people who are in the community who are working on it. I know this because I was actually invited to give a talk at an international conference on contact tracing apps at the end of January. And so I, that's where I shared this kind of information. And it turns out not everyone knew this, but it's, it's actually been confirmed in many different ways, multiple different ways now. And this first one is that actually, if you think about what the entire framework that was put forward was based on, it was based on making apps that were anonymous because no one wants to install an app that would know exactly who they are. I shouldn't say no one wants to, but generally speaking, uh, people prefer to install anonymous apps. And they were supposed to ask people to quarantine, and they did. But it turns out that the threshold that they were calibrated to, which is actually six feet, 15 minutes. I put the 30 minutes here because I was sharing this with, a, with another, uh, another country's health body. But um, if it's six feet, 15 minutes, the chance that you actually have the transmission transmit is actually under 10%. And this 10% figure was also corroborated recently. There was a, there was a research preprint, preprint that was put out by the team of epidemiologists um, based at Oxford who had been evaluating all of these apps. And they estimated that in the United Kingdom, when, uh, when they were using a, an app, which was the other kind, actually their paper was saying that the app works. But if you look at the, at the, at the, at the statistics they estimated inside, they estimated that when those apps asked somebody to quarantine, the chance that they actually tested positive, they estimated to be 6%. But now, if you think about this, is it going to work if we have people being anonymously asked to quarantine in non-enforceable ways, when the probability that they should quarantine when this anonymous non-enforceable request lands is much less than 10%? Actually, that's really, really tough. It, 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 I, I actually claim, not I claim, but if, if, you, if you think about it, if, even if you had 100% of the people installing such an app, this particular problem is as severe as trying to play chess where all you have is a king and a knight. You can have the most powerful chess computer in the world, you won't win. And so the flip is flip the incentive to self-protection where suddenly it's actually aligning with your own incentives because it might be an inconvenience to go and quarantine for the sake of other people at a relatively low chance. On the other hand, simple things that you can change, like maybe not seeing this particular friend or wearing another mask because you, anyway you wanted to be careful as you were going into that situation to protect yourself, that flip gives you one of these major gains. This is still in theory. I want to emphasize that in this particular talk, I'm laying out why there is so many, there are multiple theoretical major advantages to this approach. And then we'll talk about practice later. The second one is another fundamental flaw, actually, of all of these systems. The problem is it's actually widely known that a lot of these anonymous apps, including ours, where people are supposed to only voluntarily enter in when they're positive, have a flaw. People don't enter. So unfortunately, that is a piece that relies on altruism. And at first, my entire story I've told you so far about how this different approach works, it looks like it still has that flaw. And by the way, these percentages of how many people enter their positive status, it varies. Uh, some people in the, in, the, in the UK were analyzing something. They think it's close to half. I, I, I'm just impressed <laughs> if, if that's the case. But um, other, other people are analyzing things, and it might be closer to 20% or 10%. Unfortunately, if you're trying to make any kind of an app like this, and you don't actually have many positive signals going in, you're just not going to see anything on your radar. So the key here is that here again, this reframing of the problem from the point of view of mathematics actually gave a gain because we changed the kind of reporting. We changed from reporting a Boolean true or false value called were you or were you not directly around somebody, and we changed it to reporting a positive integer value called how many relationships away were you. The value of a positive integer is that if you think about it, it's actually useful for our system to get input signal whether you are positive or you are a contact trace contact of a positive, which by the way, at, at Georgia Tech, this is being done. And I mean, at the other universities, this is also being done. There's all this contact tracing happening, not just universities, in cities. Uh, there's contact tracing happening. And the way our system works is when the contact tracer finds that this sick person was around all of these other people, both the sick person and the contacts get 
codes that they can enter, passcodes. Passcodes are just used so that you can't overwhelm the system with false reports. But in our system, we now take input from both the positives and their contact trace contacts. Why is this useful? Well, the reason, the reason is because we're reporting a graph theoretic distance, the number of relationships in the network. So imagine that you found out through your app that somebody two relationships away from you is a contact trace contact physically near somebody who's positive. Well then, there's a person who is positive within three relationships of you. That's just called the triangle inequality in graph theory. But the principle is, if you flip from reporting Boolean true or false values, which have no intermediary value between true and false, and you flip into these non-negative integers, positive integers, uh, then suddenly, if you find out that you are D relationships away from somebody who's a contact trace contact, then you're within D plus one relationships of, a, of an actual legitimate positive case. That introduces an additive error of only plus or minus one on the horizontal axis, which is okay because that's just approximate anyway. Approximate in the sense that, you know, maybe if not everybody is using the app, which is of course the case, then there's gonna be some error in the horizontal axis anyway. And what this thing introduces is it lets you amplify the input signal by actually an order of magnitude, which is the number of contact trace contacts per positive case, at the cost of blurriness of a distance of one, which is good enough. And that actually suddenly solves the problem that only 10, 20% of people are altruistic, that's fine. With this setup, actually the entire principle of this intervention is if there is a positive case, hopefully that case shows up as a radar blip on somebody's radar, on everybody's radar, at roughly where it should be. And that's actually why there were pink, uh, pink, pink bars on the previous thing that I showed you on that, on that screenshot. The difference between the red and the pink on that particular user interface was that the, the red was actual positive and the pink was contact trace contact of a positive. And this means that if for every positive case, as long as there exists one of the case and the contact trace contacts who voluntarily enter into the system, then you get a blip at approximately the right spot. If multiple people do it, then you get a bigger blip, bigger than the actual number of people who are sick. But what matters to you as a user is not really how many blips there are, it's how far the blips are from you. Actually, just like radar, in the sense that if you were operating an actual uh, physical radar, if you see a very large blip corresponding to a, an airplane, which I guess has a very big radar signature, it's still just there. And if you happen to, comp if you happen to have a different airplane, which has got a smaller radar signature, you see a smaller blip, presumably, or a less intense signal, and both of those still indicate that there's something inbound. So that's the second piece. And actually, this is, a, this is a huge boost because of the fact that now we can solve the problem of the other systems actually having this non-entry non of signal. And the third one, the third one that actually is, a, is another issue is fortunately being addressed by testing. I think it's fantastic whenever there are approaches to have more testing. But regardless, if you happen to have asymptomatic or untested positive cases, for example, in a community, if your testing does not expand to the entire city, then actually what this thing could do is it actually can help to make up for the fact that some of the things aren't being detected. Actually, that uses statistics and the law of large numbers in the sense that if you actually just have a longer range on your radar and you can see things coming from farther away, then imagine that your radar doesn't pick up a case when it's at distance five. If the case continues to be a problem moving towards you, moving towards you here, by the way, means it infects somebody closer to you. It's not that that person is moving towards you because that person shouldn't be moving. It's just that that, pers that person who's five degrees away has infected somebody who's four degrees away and that infects someone who's three degrees away and so on. But if the five degrees away is not detected, then if it infects a few people and it's starting to move towards the four, you're getting a bigger and bigger surface area of people for whom somebody might get tested to be positive, and if they're using the app and they enter it, then suddenly that appears on everybody's radar. So the key is, if you think about what this has done compared to the status quo, actually it's very simple. The status quo showed you the equivalent of this, where you only see zero and one degree of separation, and the whole rest of the thing is invisible. The breakthrough was just noticing that if you go and flip the, the, the way you're measuring distances, uh, flip, the, flip the paradigm from focusing on distances and times, changing that into one layer of abstraction up, 
which is the network, graph theoretic distance, then suddenly you build a system which is the first pandemic network radar that we've ever seen in the world. I'm actually, one of the most surprising things is that this idea is surprisingly new. Uh, maybe there are some people who have thought about this before. Actually, if there are, and, and there, if there are people who have done this before, of course, I'll be very happy to have a, have a reference. I, I, am an, I am an academic. But to have built something like this, which can put out to scale, and then to start to test it, now that's, that's something that could actually be an advance. And if we think about what we're trying to achieve anyway as scientists, and what we're trying to achieve with, with COVID and, and future pandemics, we want to find techniques that can help to control diseases. And what you're looking at here is a very different type of technique than was ever actually deployed before, which could potentially help us significantly, well, here, if we have more variants that get trouble, or in the next disease, if we haven't yet gotten a vaccine yet. And that's actually what keeps me working on this. It's it's the feeling of if you have come up, if you have come upon something which now you've seen this whole theory, which in in theory has these major advantages over what's done before. Well, we must go out and put this out and start doing something with it. There is something else here about anonymity because actually a lot of people are often quite concerned because of all of the discussion that has been going on in media about all of these contact tracing apps. Since this is a fairly sophisticated audience, I'm going to say that. Anonymous is actually not the right word for describing what we have. I just put that on this slide because that's the, that's the colloquial word. Actually, what we do is we make a pseudonymous network. But importantly, what we do is we store these completely random user identifiers as the pseudonyms. And the key is you don't actually need to know anything about the personal information about the people. You just need to know their relative proximity. And the reason why now is the opportunity to make something like this is because enough phones have Bluetooth. And the Bluetooth can be used to communicate short range device to device where you only are recording the relative distances between people. And that you can do by using the inverse square law of uh, based on the Bluetooth signal strength. By the way, actually, if there are people here from the engineering department, you will immediately say that is highly, highly inaccurate. Uh, you're correct. Actually, that's why um, but the first version of what we made with Novid, we even used ultrasound. So we, we developed a way that would use ultrasonic pulses emitted by the speakers and the microphones of the other devices would find out how long it took for the sound pulse to travel. And that actually overcame a lot of the issues with, uh, with the Bluetooth inaccuracy. Um, unfortunately, we learned that people don't actually care too much about the accuracy. They'd rather just not have the microphone usage. So we said, that's fine. We made it optional. But the key is we, were, we did all this work around so that we wouldn't have to use GPS information because we didn't want to store in any persistent location. Uh, I mean, we didn't want to store in any database anywhere of something that could be used to read off where a person was because that one could be used to start to deduce who the person is. From a privacy front, it is actually true that since this is a pseudonymous network, you can actually unravel this. If we deployed agents to go and chase people around and we knew who those agents were, we could start to try to figure out who individual people were and you can start to unspool this data. This is true and I'm gonna say that up front. However, it is also true that there are many other apps that people use which have very similar properties that if the person who made the app was doing all kinds of evil things, they could do interesting things. For example, everybody here who's using a smartphone. If you happen to have a smartphone in the first place, uh, in theory, if Apple or Google wanted to, they could actually go and start to track all this information because sort of mathematically by definition, my information that we're collecting through the Apple device is done by asking Apple's operating system for permission to do something. So there's an inequality here where that system could actually go and do uh, and collect all this, all this information itself if it felt like it. So the way that we realized uh, was, the, was the, maybe the right way to look at this was if we collect less information, personal, less personal information than most, of the apps, than most of the apps that people are using anyway, then you start to think, why is it that people do use those apps anyway? Why do people use smartphones? You know, they, they, those smartphones could be spying on them. And in fact, they probably are. Why do people use them? It's because there's actually a value proposition to the user that's valuable. And so what we realized was, Yes, let's respect privacy, and I can answer more questions during the Q&A about the kinds of lengths that we take towards that. But maybe the key question is, how do we make sure we're delivering something that the user actually wants? And what does the user want? The user wants safety, and they want to have some way of knowing whether or not they should take more precaution. That's the radar benefit. And then what we realized as we started to deploy this is we realized that the 
sort of the biggest impact, the biggest impact factor for a deployment was whether or not those people understood that this was not an app to quarantine you, but rather this was a, the first app which actually gave you a different paradigm, this radar paradigm that you could use to try to protect yourself. Now, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to all of you because Georgia Tech was actually the first university which jumped onto this. The history of this is that uh, we were you know, working on our technology and there were people from Georgia Tech who were investigating the whole space and they reached out to us. And so as they got to know more about what we were doing, they, there was a need um, obviously to try to find interesting safe ways to go and reopen campuses. And so Georgia Tech became in fact the first group which then used this. Carnegie Mellon is where I work. So of course we also use this. And so we have noticed various interesting things from these, uh, from these deployments. Now, because of privacy, I actually can't show you anything from inside, uh, like uh, inside our system. So I want to be careful not to, not to disclose that information. Uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, I will say that we are actually working with researchers, epidemiologists, in a way that is ethically sound to be able to make further analyses of these. And this, 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 is, this is actually forthcoming. But what I, what, what I want to share here is something which I feel very comfortable sharing because this screenshot was pulled off of Reddit. And my, my, my approach to privacy is if somebody posts something on Reddit, I will, uh, I, will, I will be willing to use that as some piece of data. And so this is a piece of data from August 21st, 2020. Actually, that is from an ancient version of the Novid app. When we say ancient, uh, this app changes in its capabilities very rapidly. And so that version that's there doesn't even have strong iOS to iOS sensing. As many of you may know, if you, if you were in this community, actually in the fall, the way that the app was, uh, was advertised was keep it on the screen. We learned from feedback and we learned from the feedback of the students that that's too much to ask for. So actually we went, we went and made a breakthrough over the, over the winter, which I'll talk more about. But that's what gave us the new version, which is actually having even more robust behavior. But this is what was already showing up. That's about two weeks, one or two weeks after uh, Georgia Tech, I think, told people that there is this, there is this system. And the very interesting thing that accompanied this particular screenshot on Reddit was this was from a student, presumably, who was telling people, hey, we should get on this system because look, I've got like a thousand people connected to me already. It, it, it is connecting people on campus and people are actually using it. And that's actually where I'm going to go and talk about this, this Nash equilibrium and these different, uh, these different dynamics for, for adoption. Because one of the issues with all of these, uh, all of these, all of these apps is that if people don't join it at a critical mass, the app is useless. But the insight here, which is actually what comes from the random graph theory, random network theory that I, that I normally think about, is that actually if you generate a random sub-network where you pick certain of the nodes to be part of it, that's actually called a random graph, a random subgraph, then as long as the typical vertex has two or three connections, actually beyond one is already interesting, but as long as you have about two or three connections on average, then what happens from random graph theory is that you will already start to create this very large connected component. You basically build this, you automatically will build some system where the people who are using the app are getting connected to each other in a huge clump. And that insight from random graph theory is actually what gave us the confidence to build this in the first place. Because at that time, you may have Seen the news saying things like, well, these apps, they need to have 60, 70% of people installed, no, never going to get to there. By the way, that's the other apps where they only have the short range of vision, only going to the first degree of connection. But what we realized is actually on a university campus, this is going to happen at 5 to 10%. Over there, I say 10 to 20%. That's in the community, meaning the outside world. But the, the math is actually very simple. How do you get two or three connections in order to get this, this theory, this random graph theory to take shape and materialize? You just need that the average, the typical user has two or three connections. Well, if you're a student, the way that we construct these networks is we look over the past 14 days, that covers two weekends, and then we, then we forget about it. And if you think about how many actual in real life uh, interactions students have with other students for within this, within this like 15 feet, 20 feet radius for at least 15 minutes, actually over two weeks in a college life, uh, you you have 20 or 30, um, and actually it could be even more than that. But at that point, if you, if, you, if it's going to be 20 or 30 as your denominator of these are all the people that you actually spend time with, you will start to see this behavior of what is technically called the emergence of a giant component, 
that's from random graphs, uh, you'll see this appear when you have two or three out of those 20 or 30 who are on the app. Two or three divided by 20 to 30 is 10%. And depending on your kind of student, you might not, or of your, your kind of environment, you might not even need 10%. But it was that it was that observation that let us know that this is the kind of adoption dynamic you'd see. And this is actually what we saw play out at, say, Carnegie Mellon University, where all that happened is we just made sure that everyone understood that the principle of the app is a radar. It's not a quarantine app. It's a radar app. And as soon as people understood it was a radar app, we actually saw that the dynamic of installation went from you have to pass from the no one installs up past the threshold of about you know, 5 10%. And then suddenly, it just starts to roll down the hill like a snowball. And that's why we approach this whole thing by thinking about game theory. If you think about what we had done here, the goal was to think about how does game theory and network theory, how do game theory and network theory affect these kinds of adoption dynamics? How would you design this entire system? And effectively, what you've seen here is we've basically designed an entirely different set of rules, which in theory, and also apparently in practice, it turns into adoption. But in theory, it actually has these major advantages over what has been done before in the space of trying to use smartphones to control disease. Here, I also want to say a big thank you to all of the people at Georgia Tech for realizing that this was that what we were doing was different from other people. Actually, when we were working with the first group, they, with, with the group that brought us on at Georgia Tech, they recognized that we were doing things that were different from others. Actually, back then, the biggest thing we were doing that was different was using ultrasound to measure distance more carefully. But over, over time, I mean, we just kept doing things differently. And what we are very proud of doing is we're proud of trying to pioneer to find out what are the ways that you would try to use smartphones to control a disease. And for us, I, I mean, I am an academic. For us, this is collaboration. And if, one, if we collaborate, we actually can pioneer this new way of trying to stop a disease. Just to emphasize how much pioneering is needed, let me say another comment about iPhones. Because I, I did mention that one of the big problems that we found out was that students didn't want to leave an app on the front of the screen all the time. We don't blame them. But it wasn't that we weren't trying to give them a better experience. Actually, it was assumed by the entire world that it's impossible to make an app for which the iPhones are able to talk to other iPhones when the apps aren't on screen. The reason people assumed it was impossible is that, for example, the United Kingdom spent 10 million pounds trying to make an app that would do this sort of a thing, and they couldn't crack that nut. Uh, Germany also spent a significant amount of money, millions of euros. France was, is still struggling. They've been trying it. Singapore is still struggling. Australia is still trying to do this too. There were five national governments all trying to go and make these systems where the iPhones could talk to the iPhones. The reason why that's tough, by the way, is because, just a, a technical thing, on, on an Android device, you can have lots of different things running in the background of the operating system. And that's why Android phones sometimes feel a bit sluggish when you have too many apps on. iPhones, on the other hand, severely restrict what you can do in the background. And that's one reason why iPhones feel snappy. Well, I'm very happy to say that over the winter break, we were working extremely hard, and we actually managed to figure out how to make the iPhones talk to each other. Um, that there's a lot behind that. But you will have noticed that if you actually have an iPhone and you're using this app now, it actually does connect to other people without you having to do any extra intervention. And that kind of pioneering is what we are about. I mean, we are just trying to figure out how you'd solve these problems. And to be able to work together with you is, is, a, is a wonderful opportunity. And what we are seeking to do is simply to make sure that we have discovered and shown the world that there is a totally different way to fight diseases that can be used complementarily. Any positive signals from tests, any other approaches that people are using, better devices that people have, all of these work complementarily. But by simply having this new way of being able to collect these, these, uh, these, these pieces of information anonymously, you actually unlock the possibility that is actually even bigger. And this is the last thing I'm going to comment on, which is nowadays, we've actually cracked something which is quite interesting in the app space. The biggest problem in the app space was how to make an app that people will actually want to install. And unfortunately, if you're only asking people to quarantine, that's not compelling. We have found out that uh, giving people a way to see a radar is compelling. Suddenly, we have a very large network. And this unlocks for the first time a way for us to have real-time data on interactions between vaccines, between positive tests, between infections. Actually, again, because of what I said about how nobody else managed to figure out how to make the iPhones talk to each other, 
we have the only app in the entire world which is capable of doing this at this point. And what we are doing and working together with epidemiologists on is we have these anonymized data sets which have information about user ID whatever and user ID whatever were around at this distance at this time. We are actually populating this. The newer version that you'll see roll out probably in about one, two weeks is something that you can even in, in, insert your vaccination status. Well, that is a way that you as a user can have some idea of whether or not your vaccination radar is looking good. But for us, what, why I started this whole thing in the first place was the graph theory combined with these kinds of health signals, completely anonymized, are actually what could help very much in the world. And by the way, that is one reason why these other national efforts originally wanted the generality of having an app that could collect this kind of information, but they couldn't crack two pieces. One piece they couldn't crack was the user incentives. The other piece they couldn't crack was just how to program the iPhone, which actually is highly non-trivial. Uh, and, and then, so, so what we are what we are trying to do, and why this has why this has actually far more exciting potential than just you know just an app to try to control a disease is let well let's sum up what do we have here? We have a theoretical framework which has a very different way of approaching disease than was ever available before uh, for humankind. It actually could provide people with an automatic with a new feedback loop which actually reduces the number of cases. I mean, if you give people greater ability to protect themselves, then uh, if that's aligned with their incentives, then you could actually help to reduce the incidence of a disease that of course needs to be tested properly. And the only way to do that is to actually have more deployments. But at the same time, we've actually already solved another part, which is how to make an app that the average person might actually want to install that will help to inform epidemiological efforts when you have 4,000 COVID variants running around in the world. Actually, with this system, we are able to see if there's suddenly a new rapid spreading um, infection in an area, we don't know what is, the, what is the exact GPS location of that area, but we know roughly, we know the first three digits of the zip code. And that, that's on purpose because for HIPAA reasons, uh, for the health uh, privacy reasons, first three digits of the zip code you can collect. But so with all of this information, you would actually potentially be able to go and start trying to find out what's going on in those regions. And also there's the other deep question of how long does the immunity last? I think that's a good question. It'd be very, very nice to answer, answer that question as well, um, and especially in real time. So that's roughly what I wanted to share with you of, 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 these, of these things that we're working on. Uh, as you can see, these are all about different ways that you might try to approach a disease. And this is all from the point of view of the theory, but uh, it's not every day that you have theory with several orders of magnitude potential gain over status quo, which also unlocks a totally different way that you could approach disease control. Thank you. Thank you very much, Poe. Uh, we greatly appreciate this, uh, uh, I guess, dive into the science behind Novid. Um, I guess the floor is open for questions. Uh, I'd encourage the audience to uh, uh, ask their questions via the Q&A feature on BlueJeans. Um, I can see those and publish them, and uh, then you can also uh, like a question, and we can we can organize them that way. Um, so so far, we only have one question in the uh, in the Q and A. I have a series of questions next to me that I I, I took as you were talking. Um, uh, but the question that we have, uh, one question we have from the audience, and I'm not sure if you're able to share some of this information, but there's a question on how many people have downloaded the app to date. Do you know that number? I do. So I do know how many people have downloaded the app worldwide to date, but that number I'm going to disclose right away is not so interesting because we know that there are people downloading the app who just want to know how it works. However, that is still an interesting proxy for, you know, our people looking at this. So it's not huge. Actually, it's only, according to this, it's only 112,867, uh, which is considered actually quite small if you're trying to do something on world scale. But then again, actually, if you compare, um, <laughs> that's, also, that, that's also not 1,000, let's just say. Uh, but I will say in terms of like how many people are actually actively using this, I'll tell you that because that's, that's an aggregate information that doesn't say anything about people. We have roughly on the order of 20,000 people who are somehow actively sending data. And that's just worldwide. The important thing, though, is that we, if you, if you saw the way this works, you actually need to have the positive signals. Ideally, work, ideally, you're working with somebody who's helping to go and validate that these are positive signals. So we're actually not trying, we weren't trying to just go and spread this worldwide. Instead, what we were trying is we were trying to have this be used by the forward, th forward thinking places that could understand the theory and say, you know what, this is something that we do want to be part of. 
And as the success is being seen here, we're seeing that this is rapidly moving to a point where we might be able to get scientific, more scientific people jumping in and joining the fray, other epidemiologists and so on. At that point, we would then hope to go and blow this up much, much, much bigger. Great, thank you. And I saw you grabbed your phone when you answered that. Uh, I know uh, it's possible when I was playing around with the app, you can actually see how many people downloaded that. So that information is public. Um, and then uh, if you're within the Georgia Tech community, you can also see how many members are uh, within that community. So that information is available for, uh, yeah, <laughs> for the public. We have another question that came in. Uh, this is from, uh, I think it's Nitty. Uh, fascinating lecture. Can you give a high? Can you give high-level details on how you crack the iPhone problem? I know that was an issue we had in the fall. You you alluded to it uh, being something you worked on over the winter holidays. Uh, any details that you can share there? Because yeah, that that was a a big 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 step change. Uh, yes, that was a big step change. Okay, so here, here's what I'll say. Uh, I will share a few things which will maybe help you. I don't know if you're a student or a faculty. If you're a student, students will definitely want to know this because you probably want to make some interesting apps. Um, I will share it in a way that won't give too many details away, but here's how I'll explain it. The situation is that if you read all of the iOS operating system documentation, it's on apple.com, <laughs> developer.apple.com. There's a lot of things that say, this particular function call will do X except when Y. And it suddenly becomes a giant puzzle. Uh, the, the thing is that, okay, if you make enough puzzle pieces, it will be that somehow the exception cases will cover each other in various ways. So effectively what we did is we ended up combining four different operating system calls that you might not normally think of using at the same time. They are all legitimate. None of them are illegal. All of them are being used by other apps. So in some sense, disabling one would cause all kinds of apps to do weird stuff. But the point is, if you understand how all of these various pieces fit together, then you can put them together in a way where each one's failure mode is covered by another one's success mode. Another thing I'll tell you is that one of those operating system calls we discovered by accident, just to tell you a story, because you, if you're a student, I'm, I'm just guessing, if you ask this question, maybe you're a student. Uh, if you're not, I don't mean to insult you, but it's just like students are always curious. I'll tell you, here's a story. One of these things was, was discovered by a bug because we had at some point a crash in the system where we found out that something we were calling, one of our operating system calls, was causing the app to crash. And that's how we logged in the back of our head, that operating system call does this except when that. And it turned out that that particular piece ended up being one of the four pieces we ended up joining together because we learned the behavior of an if X then Y. That's one piece. But another piece I can give on a more general statement is, there's a reason why our paradigm actually lets us do this. It's because we've moved away from the paradigm of figure out if you were next to the person in the grocery store for 15 minutes at six feet. That one, being able to have the iPhone constantly detect that kind of a short range and short time, that takes a ton of battery. That's why all the other apps had trouble. We don't need that. What we're really interested in is we're trying to track the superhighway, which is called who lives with who, who works with who, who has lunch with who regularly. I have lots and lots of opportunities to capture that. So we have a way to do this in a much more battery saving way. And I'm just explaining from a mathematical perspective, we're answering a different question. And by changing the question that we ask, which just so happens to give all the orders of magnitudes of gains, that's how we broke through. Great. Cool. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. Um, we have a, a question here from uh, Ken Kunifer. I'm just going in the order at which they were uh, posted. Um, uh, you mentioned this briefly in your talk. Uh, 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 there was there's a situation where there's concern that people could falsely report positives, right? And so there is the ability to block, uh, uh, I guess, that feature. And so the question from Ken Kunifer is: uh, Communities can block self-reporting of positive tests. Uh, that's something I think Georgia Tech did uh, to prevent that kind of bombing approach. Um, might there be a mechanism where a user presents a test report to some community admin and then receive a code to make a verified report, right? Um, any other thoughts on other improvements there? Because that, that, that concern of a false positive uh, kind of locks out certain self-reporting features. Yes, actually, I think that the way, again, I think this depends on the university, but I believe that at Carnegie Mellon, if I find out that I'm positive through some other way, I actually have to tell my university health services. So I, I'm a professor, I believe that if I discovered somehow that I'm positive, I think it's one of my agreements that I have that says that I must tell someone. And at that point, that person I'm telling at Carnegie Mellon is the person who issues these positive test codes anyway. 
So I'm not sure if that's, I don't, I'm not sure how the system works at Georgia Tech. Maybe you, maybe you faculty don't have to tell if you're positive. I don't know. Or maybe your students don't have to tell. But I think that somehow our students and our faculty do. Now, the thing that you've just described of have somebody else validate that. In fact, we have thought about that. And in fact, the reason why we're pushing this is because it's opening a door for a new category of thing. And I'm not claiming that the first iteration is perfect. As we know, the first iteration had to have, had to have trouble detecting iPhones. But what you're describing is there could be a completely separate entity whose only job is to go and validate whether or not tests were positive and give codes to us without ever telling us who they were looking at. The one thing I don't want, I don't want anyone ever sending me an email with their name and their test result and say, can I have a code? I don't want our system to ever know your name. So that's why we built it this way. But to answer another thing about the self-reporting, we actually are, in the next version, rolling out something where the chart on the red thing distinguishes between which things were verified self-reports and which, sorry, verified positives and which ones were just self-reported positives. Once we split those two, we're actually just going to open the floodgates and say, hey, anyone who wants to report without the code, they can, but everyone's going to take it with a grain of salt because they will all know you're in the Georgia Tech community. Why in the world didn't you go and get, you know, a verified positive? You should have. Um, but if, if somebody just needed to report another one, it will cause everyone to just say, okay, maybe there's something here, but I'll take that with a grain of salt. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is kind of around privacy, so you may want to answer the, the larger question, but the specific question is, is there any variety of use in the user data? Right. Um, I think the question has to deal with, uh, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned this pseudonymous data, uh, but there are differences in smartphone usage across different users, user groups, um, especially even more so in healthcare applications. So could you just talk in general to the variety of uses for user data and the privacy behind Novid? Yes, absolutely. So I actually want to be very, very clear up front. This is pseudonymous, not anonymous, and therefore I'm not going to be able to guarantee that somehow you can't unravel things this way. Actually, I'm going to go right ahead and explain an attack that someone could make on this. As a mathematician, what we do is we try to lay out the whole situation, and even if it's not favorable, I'm going to lay it all out. Here's something you could do with the data on this. You could go and imagine this was being used all through the US. You could start to cluster who is around who without knowing who anyone is. You'd start to cluster and find out there's this lump that's probably a city. And here's another lump that's a city. After you look at the whole United States, you would eventually get to figure out that there's this northeast corridor of Washington, DC, Baltimore, uh, whatever the cities are, Philadelphia, you know, all, all the way up to Boston. And as you figure these out, you'd be able to say, here's Boston. Okay. Now let's go and find everyone in Boston. Let's figure out who is active at 1 a.m. Those are the college students. Go and figure out how they cluster and you match them against the universities. Then you go and say, look at that. That matches where Harvard is. Great, what's the Harvard dorm layout? And then you start to go and match those up. So I'm explaining that you can actually go and use this stuff to go quite far. Um, unfortunately, when you have such a system, such things are possible. And by the way, if you are using a smartphone, you are already subjecting yourself to that being possible because Apple and Google have all of your data anyway. So what I want to emphasize is I do not promise that it's impossible to do that because it's impossible to make that promise. The only thing I can tell you is a lot of the other things you're using already have that capability and a lot of those other companies have the express purpose of using that to sell you stuff and to sell your personal data. We, on the other hand, <laughs> happen to have a very strange situation where we happen to become the only group in the world capable of doing this thing because of the paradigm shift and the iPhone breakthrough. And we're run by, whether you like it or not, a crazy guy. And what you have seen already of what we're trying to do with this is the exact opposite of all of that. I'm trying to emphasize that all of these things are possible to do, and the question is, who's doing it? And now, just to give you an idea of the degree that we go to on privacy that is extreme, it's like this. One of the ways we figure out if two people are nearby is we check if they're on the same Wi-Fi access point. Okay. The way that Apple and Google do that is by recording the MAC address of your access point. In fact, it is well known that Google went and drove their street view cars through everywhere with Wi-Fi scanners so they could figure out which MAC address corresponds to what GPS. That's how Google does such a great job of giving you a precise location on your phone, even if you're in Manhattan. So the, so the point is, there are already companies which go through all the effort to actually log the exact MAC address. So what do we do? We actually set up a separate system, a separate server, where whenever we sense a, a MAC address from a Wi-Fi access point, we actually run that MAC address into the other server without any user ID information. And back from the server comes a temporary code 
that's associated with that MAC address, we store the code in our database, the temporary code. Why? Because if somebody else hits that same one at the same time, the temporary code's good for 30 minutes, they get another copy of the same temporary code. I can now test equality. I can test whether you are on the same Wi-Fi access point without knowing what was the MAC address. So that's the level of what we go through to try to make it so it's harder to do such things. And what are we actually doing with that data? We are not doing what I just described. Although I would actually not put it past all the other companies that they are. So I, all I can say is, yeah, unfortunately, I can't give you a promise. All I can say, I mean, a mathematical promise, it's impossible to give you that. On the other hand, we have found that enough people consider it to be a good enough value prop to use a smartphone to subject themselves to even worse. And so we, 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 we just found out that this thing, the way to answer this is it gives a user value. And any user who thinks that the value of the radar is big enough will join. Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, uh, I have a question that I want to get to, but I want to make sure we answer the audience questions as well. Uh, there's an interesting observation. So when you look at kind of the uh, degrees of separation or the connections that you have, uh, the observation is that it tends to peak around four to five degrees away, and then it decreases to zero uh, before reaching 12, right? Degrees of separation. That's just kind of an observation from the, the things you showed. I've also noticed that myself when I look at my own smartphone that it tends to decrease. Uh, did you, is there something more to be said about that? Is there, is there some more insight that you have there? So the reason why is because the number of people using this is only restricted to the campus at Georgia Tech. Originally, when we talked to Georgia Tech, actually our whole goal was to make a collaboration with Georgia Tech researchers and Georgia Tech in general to expand this into Atlanta. Because actually the original goal was, if you can get Atlanta using this too, then you will be safer in Georgia Tech because there will just be less cases even coming in. That was the entire point. Now, if you have this in Atlanta, you will not see that phenomenon. Because the reason why it's going up and down is that the nature of the campus is such that you're kind of topping out on your relationships physical relationships at around this four, five, six, seven. But if you could go into the whole Atlanta, you'd, you would not see the mountain go up to 10,000 at height four or five. That's actually not going to happen. You just see it keep going up like an exponential. I see. Got it. So it has to do with the fact that we have chosen to make our own little community. Great. Um, now, there were a couple of things that you mentioned, and you mentioned uh, uh, you, you went into details about being able to self-report vaccines. Right. Uh, on one of your slides, you also had a kind of thing about being able to self-report symptoms. Um, I'm really intrigued by that potential for the future because it provides a lot more uh, data uh, than we would normally see. Uh, could, could you, you know, give us a preview or tell us a little bit more? When, when, when would we likely see that, uh, I guess, update? Um, what else can we learn from that? Yeah. So again, remember the reason why I started this whole thing as a Hertz fellow was I think that the world could use something like this with this huge anonymized data set run by, let's just say, a researcher to go and do some actual analysis on what's going on. So when we will see that thing show up in the app, we actually are thinking it should be about one, two weeks out to get that particular piece going out into the app, which will start to collect this data. Now, in terms of actually analyzing the data, I'm not the, I'm not the right person to be analyzing it directly. On the other hand, I've actually been spending most of my time nowadays talking to epidemiologists, talking to other researchers, and as the epidemiologists are finding out that this exists, actually quite a few people are very excited because we do need to know what to do with immunity. We do need to know how long does the Moderna vaccine last in actual current situation? How long does the Pfizer vaccine last in the current environment that it's in? And, you know, if we could deploy sequencing in various areas, if we could, it would be great if we had a sequencing. UK has a lot of sequencing. But if we had sequencing, we could even potentially start to guess which strains are circulating and who might have the strains. With regard to the symptoms, the reason why we wanted to collect the symptoms is because it would actually start to become possible to figure out if you've got a person who's a confirmed positive and then somehow there are symptoms emerging you would have some way of even guessing whether or not these might emerge into real cases. Or if you had a trail with symptoms between two positives, you might have a guess of that's how it got across from the first to the other. Great, thank you. I said there was gonna be one more question uh, that I had, but I just saw another one come in that's a really good question. Uh, so I wanna make sure we get to it if you can give me a few more minutes. Um, it's actually a two-part question. Uh, the first question is, can you speak to the importance of widely available diagnostic and frequent surveillance testing, surveillance testing 
in order for an app like this to provide accurate radar es uh, estimates. So how important, uh, uh, yeah, is widely available diagnostic and frequent surveillance testing? So I think that testing is extremely important. Now, the way that we've built this is that the more testing you have, the more information you start to get, which can start to help more people be cautious. And in fact, that's, I'll say, one of the things that you at Georgia Tech, you have a lot more testing, which is, well, I don't know how to say more, but you definitely have a lot of testing going on. And that's why we can see on our system that the radar alerts are going out because people actually have gotten the tests and then they're putting the signals into the radar. So it is important to have these tests. However, the way that this was designed, it was actually designed so that even in environments which don't have this, this can help them because we're not only talking to university communities. What I'm trying to say is if you've got all those tests, fantastic. This is gonna give you all kinds of information and it's great. But if you're working with say a country that's not as sophisticated on testing and maybe has more limited testing available, well, this will help you when you get a positive test. It'll help you suggest who else might be a good person to test. I don't wanna say any test is ever wasted, but in some sense, if your test that you're deploying could land more reliably on positive people, that will give some value. And this, this system could actually even be used to help to allocate the tests, because remember, we're using both tests and symptoms now. So the point is, if you actually are now combining this information about symptoms and where the tests are, in a, in a situation where you don't have enough tests, actually, this is what would add a huge amount of value compared to status quo. Basically, other people before this didn't have access to that interaction network. So then you're sort of blind. But once you combine the two, then you have something. Got it. Yep. That it makes a lot of sense. I was remembering, you know, before we had testing rolled out, uh, you know, we did have uh, people trying to diagnose and see where we are just based upon symptoms. So, yeah, I think we have to remember that, you know, not every place is as fortunate to have uh, frequent diagnostic and surveillance testing available. The second part to this question was, uh, you know, you have those estimates, uh, uh, these radar estimates. How could Novid communicate the confidence intervals to users across various communities? Right. So what about the uncertainty or the confidence intervals uh, associated with the reports? So this is, again, where there are so many different interesting directions this can go into. And we're actually pushing on all of these things. Which it's hard to push them all at once. But here's where it's interesting. It's because we actually have a way of measuring how dense the actual Novid usage is in an area because Android devices are able to scan to find out how many other Bluetooth devices there are around. So for example, we actually could figure out whether or not the general install density in an area is low or high. That's a really important parameter because that will give us some information about how confident we are that you know, there, there aren't other invisible connections that are going in between. So that's one piece that can go in. And the second piece that can go in that's useful is that right now the way Georgia Tech is working with us, every single positive case translates into a code that's generated into our, into our system. And so we know that happened, we know that got logged. And then the question is, did anyone enter it or not? So we have this information about how many cases are there, how many are actually being entered into the system. That gives you some level of understanding of what is the, what is the, what is the missing stuff, if that makes sense. Now, yep. do I have an exact answer yet? No, uh, this is actually something where there's a lot of work that can still be done. However, the important thing of why I wanted to give this talk is it's exciting to have a new approach that opens all of these as possible doors that we can run down. Because if you didn't have the new paradigm shift of report distances by network, actually none of these questions can even be asked. Now that we can ask all of these questions, we have ways to amplify our human civilization's approach to diseases. And this is just one, but one new potential contribution to all of that. Great. All right. So uh, I don't see any other questions in our Q&A panel. Uh, so with that, I guess I will conclude the, the lecture. Uh, uh, Po, thank you very much for taking the time this evening. Uh, thank you for all the hard work you're doing uh, uh, creating Novid and for sharing uh, the science behind it. Uh, we're very appreciative to uh, uh, you know, all the information you've been sharing with us and also all the hard work your team is doing. Uh, Matt, would you like to say some concluding remarks? No, you said it well, Shannon. Thanks very much. And just, Poe, I also appreciate um, the effort you put into explaining things like this to the general public because, you know, it's, um, I, I think the mathematics behind it and the science behind it are very sophisticated, but I think you, you um, find it important 
to try to communicate these things at, at a level that everyone can understand. And, you know, to me, that was done um, really well. So thanks for that, as well as for the actual app and the, and the research behind it. Well, and I'll just say thank you, Georgia Tech. It's a real pleasure to be able to work with you. And again, I actually always have seen Georgia Tech as a pioneering institution because you are very good in my area of research, which is network theory. And it's a real pleasure to be able to work with all of you. Great. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate it. And uh, with that, I will uh, conclude the lecture.